Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement at JTS, and I'm very happy to welcome you to today's session of our summer series on the dynamics of change. And uh, we apologize for the short delay in getting started today. Uh, we're so uh, pleased to have a new faculty member teaching us today, um, Annabelle Cohen, who's a, who's a uh, PhD candidate in Modern Jewish Studies at JTS, um, is just as importantly, if not more importantly for this context, the curator of um, the current exhibit in the JTS library, which is called Living Yiddish in New York, which has gotten uh, wonderful attention in the press and is a terrific exhibit. So those in the New York area, we would love for you to come join us before the exhibit closes in October. Um, and it's just always so nice to have new faculty um, members for our series sharing their expertise. So we're excited about her session today, um, which is on Becoming Jewish Americans, Popular Culture and Protest in Yiddish New York. Um, welcome to anyone who may be joining us for the first time today. And if you wanna see previous sessions, you can do that. Um, you can find all previous sessions on the series page that was in your confirmation email this morning. Uh, we're so pleased to um, thank our sponsors for today, Audrey and Yale Asfeld. Um, Yale is the JTS trustee and they're sponsoring today at the Chacham level in memory of Audrey's grandparents. Um, so we're, we're so pleased to be offering this session in, in their memory as well. Um, we would invite anyone to uh, be inspired by this learning with JTS scholars to consider sponsoring a session. And uh, we have three sponsorship levels, Chacham for 540, Tzadik for 1000, and Navi for 1800. And you can learn more about that at the link that's being posted in the chat now. Um, we will be doing Q&A today as usual. You can send your questions to me, Rabbi Julia Andelman, via the chat. Um, at any point, and I'll just ask you to keep them both both concise and clear, since I get a lot of questions. Um, I'm more likely to get to your question if it is those two things, concise and clear. And um, so we'll stop a couple of times during the session as well as at the end. And I will get to as many questions as I can. Um, and I'm just seeing that I have the wrong <laughs> the wrong bio um, here in my in my internotes, so I'm so sorry about that. But I know that um, the correct bio for Annabelle Cohen is on the source sheet, so we will find it momentarily there. Um, and Annie, I'm going to turn it over to you to teach us now. Okay, <laughs> now I'm unmuted. Thank you so much, Rabbi Julia, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, not to worry about my bio, my bio is still a work in progress, as is some of this research. Um, I'm going to start just by sharing my screen. And by pressing play. So um, as Rabbi Julia said, I um, had the honor this year of curating uh, this exhibition, which is currently on display in the JTS Library, Living Yiddish in New York. It's an exhibition that really showcases JTS's Yiddish archives. Um, and it was really, it's like a, a dream for a researcher just to be told, you know, go into the archives and find the story that's interesting. Um, and it was very striking and I guess not really surprising how many Yiddish archives JTS has that have to do with New York as um, a very important, one of the most important centers of modern Yiddish life and culture. Um, and today I'm mostly going to be speaking about um, materials that I found uh, and that are on display in that exhibition. But I'm also going to tie in a little bit of my own research on the Jewish left, on the mostly Yiddish speaking Jewish left, um, and how it connects uh, to the story that is told in the exhibition. Um, it was actually an exciting 
surprise for me to discover how many materials JTS has um, on the, the Yiddish speaking Jewish left. Um, and I, I hope that this exhibition has gone some way to document them and make them available um, for further, for other researchers. Um, so we begin the exhibition with this item, which anyone who here who reads Yiddish, you might be able to see, is a biography of Benjamin Franklin and the story of the Befreiung von America, the, the liberation of America. Um, and this is the only item in the whole exhibition that actually wasn't printed and published in New York. It was printed and published in Warsaw, but we included it just to um, demonstrate the dream that America represented for Eastern European Jews in the late 19th century. So we're talking about a period, um, if you're familiar with modern Jewish history, a major theme is Jewish emancipation, the strive for Jews to be um, to obtain citizenship in an era where universal citizenship, the you know republics like America, like France, which is where I currently am, um, this idea of all all men at least being equal. Um, and Jews being included in that. And that is still very much a work in progress in Eastern Europe and in Russia, where, which is home to the majority of Eastern European Jews. Um, Jews will not receive citizenship until, until the revolution of 1917. So the, the idea, the ideal of America, a place where theoretically there is uh, opportunity for all, equal opportunity for all, is a very exciting one. Um, and many Jews aspired to emigrate here, and many did. Um, millions of Jews emigrated to New York at the end of the, in the late 19th, early 20th century, and millions still settled in New York City, which uh, by the beginning of World War I was home to the largest urban population of Yiddish speakers um, in the world. Here's another item that kind of demonstrates that. This was also an item that was made to help Yiddish speaking immigrants who arrived in America and did not speak English. This is uh, one of many copies in the JTS archives and in existence of the Constitution of the United States translated into Yiddish. Um, and this is actually, these are the last two items in the exhibit, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm including them here at the beginning. These are two posters um, made by the United War Work campaign during World War I. Um, on this first one, the one on the left, there's, it's a speech given by Woodrow, uh, President Woodrow Wilson translated into Yiddish. Um, and these are these posters are calling on Yiddish speaking Jews to support their country. Um, and this is these are very interesting because they are speaking to Jews in Yiddish. Um, but referring to them as Americans support your boys in Europe, support your country, your people. And they are talking about the American people. Um, and this is also something that I want to touch on a little bit during this, this webinar, um, is this idea of America and New York in particular, this ideal of the melting pot, um, but of New York as a multicultural city where many Yiddish speaking Jews saw it not only as a place where they would, they would be able to ch achieve political and economic equality, they would have the same opportunities as everybody else, unlike in Europe. It was also seen as a place where the Yiddish language and Yiddish culture and Jewish culture might be able to survive. And to some extent, that is true. Um, this was very exciting for me uh, to curate, as I'm sure you can tell from my accent, a non-American um, Jewish student who very much came to New York in part because of the fact that New York is still an important center for Yiddish and Yiddish culture. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about 
that vision as well, um, and particularly how that vision for um, the survival of this minority language and minority culture um, was, was perpetuated on the Jewish left. Um, so here's a, a nice example. This isn't from the exhibition. This is actually from a source that I often use in uh, Yiddish classes that I teach. This is from a um, Haggadah, uh, a Passover Haggadah, um, used by the New York School Committee, the New York School Committee. So New York was home to a number of Yiddish supplementary schools many of them run by um, political organizations, socialist or communist organizations or Zionist organizations. This is an example of a Zionist um, Haggadah, but actually it's very interesting to read because it refers much, much more to the American uh, dream and to this dream of America, um, not only as a land of the free and of equal opportunity, but also as a land where Jews can be Jews. Um, can practice as Jews, can speak Yiddish, can have our own culture alongside other cultures. Um, and you can read a little bit. I'll, I'll read uh, a little bit for you in Yiddish and you can follow along with the English. This is the, the leader of the Seder says this and the, a child will reply. Wir sein ein freier Bürger von unser größer Amerika. We are free citizens of our great America. Um, wir feiern dem Jontif Pesach, wie unser Hart, Harz glust. Here we can celebrate the, the festival of Passover just as our hearts desire. Uh, weißt ihr für was? Do you know why? Why can we do this in America? Das ist der Fahr, weil die erste Deures Amerikaner nicht jeden und jeden seinen gekommen Herr von Länder, wo man hat geplagt und gereute. Da in Amerika haben sie verpflanzt Freiheit für alle Men. So Jews and non-Jews came to this place um, persecuted from places where they were persecuted. But here in America, right at the beginning of the country, we planted the seeds of freedom for everybody. And I believe you have these on your source sheet, maybe we'll go back to them, but for the sake of time, I'm not gonna read the whole of um, each source, but they go on to say, so you know, if you've ever taken part in a Seder, there's a kind of call and response and most Haggadahs have a, um, a pattern where different people get to read. So now the leader says, let's hear some lines from the poem, which is engraved on the magnificent freedom statue. And I'm sure you can guess which statue and which poem they're talking about. So here you have Emma Lazarus's famous poem engraved on the Statue of Liberty, translated into Yiddish. And something I find very interesting is that in the Yiddish and Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've read the English original and I don't think that this is in it. The Yiddish ends um, with the golden door. A breiter ufgemacht. In, in Yiddish, the, the golden door is wide open. So they've even added this, this symbolism. And here's another example of um, this kind of. Uh, this image of America as the new country, a new country that is based on different ideals to the old country of Europe, where Jews and other peoples have been persecuted. Das neue Land, this is an example of um, one of the many literary journals that was printed in New York. This is um, a journal edited by Avram Reisen, a very important writer and Yiddishist, and one of the many. Uh, important Yiddish writers who lived and died in New York, buried in Mount Carmel Cemetery on the Celebrity Row. If you visit Mount Carmel Cemetery in Queens, you can see this row of very famous authors, writers, Yiddish political thinkers and uh, activists, who, and you know, all of whom, uh, when they died in the early 20th century, late 19th century, had funerals that, you know, filled the streets of Manhattan. 
Um, and you can see some of the other famous names of writers who, whether or not they made New York their home, as uh, Raisin did, they um, certainly spent time here. Sholem Ash, for example, one of the big names of modern uh, Yiddish literature in this, um, in this journal, Dosnaya Land. Um, and here on the right hand side, you have a picture of, uh, I believe this is Hester Street in New York. And it's quite hard to see here. In fact, it's impossible to see, it's very blurry. This is an image from the New York Public Library. But if you visit the JTS Library before October, you'll see that this is blown up currently on the window and that it reads here a strictly kosher chicken shop, strictly kosher chicken shop. So if I've achieved one thing during my time at JTS as a PhD student, I've got the library labeled as a strictly kosher chicken shop. Um, and this is just one of many examples of the Yiddish street signs that used to cover certain areas of Manhattan. Um, here we have a postcard from the JTS collections. Yiddish Zeitungen in America, Jewish newspapers in America. As you can see, there are a few here um, also in English. Um, I think a couple of Hebrew newspapers, but I actually went through all of the, the Yiddish newspapers, which are the majority, um, and the vast majority of them were written and published in New York City. Um, by the beginning of the 20th century, by the outbreak of World War I in 1914, New York City has become a hugely important center of modern Yiddish culture. New York City was home to the first popular Yiddish press market. I think by 1897, when the, the Forwärts first appeared, and we're going to look at the Forwärts in a second, the the Yiddish uh, Jewish Daily Forward, which still exists. Um, Jew Yiddish readers in New York could already choose from three Yiddish dailies and a whole number of other publications. And this didn't exist anywhere else in, in the Tsarist Empire in Russia. You had that, you know, there was very heavy censorship. It was very difficult for um, Yiddish newspapers both to receive the funding they needed and then the legal permission they needed to stay afloat. So you have kind of, of course, you have Yiddish publications emerging, but this is the first Yiddish press market on this scale in the world. Um, and an example of that, the, the Forwärts, the Yiddish Forward, and this is an example of a print edition from 1982. The Forwärts was founded uh, in New York in 1897 by the famous figure, famous socialist figure, um, Abe Khan. And uh, this was, in fact, the, the most popular non-English language newspaper in America. Um, it is the longest running Yiddish newspaper in the world founded in 1897. It only went out of print, um, like paper print in, in uh, 2019. And it still is printed, you know, it still exists as the Jewish Daily Forward today in English. And it also still exists in Yiddish, although now only online. Um, I've even written Yiddish articles for the Forward, which for um, me being very excited about modern Yiddish culture was a huge uh, COVID honor. Um, and delight. The Yiddish Forward is also um, one example of the huge Jewish labor movement that emerged in America and uh, especially in New York, New York City. And at first um, it was a predominantly Yiddish speaking Jewish labor movement, um, which we'll, we're gonna talk about quite a lot today. Um, this is another rarer example um, of a Jewish leftist publication. This is actually a communist magazine. This was a monthly journal, Der Hammer, um, which was the, the kind of literary journal that went together with the Yiddish communist newspaper, the Morgen Freiheit, which um, began publication in the 1920s after the creation of the Communist Party of the USA and it had a the Communist Party of the USA had a, a Jewish section, a Jewish bureau. 
Um, just to give you an example of the size of the Yiddish press in, uh, in New York, but also um, Jewish participation in the communist movement. Um, and on the left, the Morgen Freiheit, the, the newspaper, had a wider readership uh, in the interwar period than the daily worker, than the, the English communist newspaper. Uh, the, Yiddish, the Yiddish version was more popular. Um, Jew, the Jewish communists were always a minority um, in the kind of overall Jewish community, um, but they were a very strong presence in the communist movement. And they were a strong presence at various times as well in the wider Jewish community of New York, and especially the Yiddish speaking Jewish community. Um, here's an example of another, again, uh, rarer, even rarer, uh, Yiddish political publication from New York City. This newspaper I'd never heard of until I discovered it in the JTS collection, Der Yid. This is a Zionist newspaper. It claims to be um, describing the first organized Zionist uh, movement in New York City. It's from 1905. It describes, among other things, um, the death of Theodore Herzl. This is a, a mainstream Zionist publication, tend to associate Yiddish, and certainly Yiddish was kind of continued a lot longer on the Zionist left. Um, but this is a mainstream publication um, associated with the World Zionist Movement. It also describes the very first uh, Zionist demonstration in New York City or what it claims to be the very first Zionist demonstration in New York City. And interestingly, um, this newspaper also describes something that I wanna talk about a bit, which is this political commitment to Yiddish culture and to, to a Jewish culture that is autonomous, that isn't a, you know, a, a commitment to not total uh, acculturation and assimilation, to maintaining a distinct uh, Jewish culture. Among the articles in this, uh, in this edition of Der Yid um, is an article about Jewish culture and the Yiddish and Hebrew languages. And the writer writes, you can't, you can't express, you can't tell Jewish jokes in English. Jewish culture has to be in Yiddish or in Hebrew. Both Yiddish and Hebrew are okay, <laughs> are great, um, but you can't, especially Jewish jokes, they're just not as funny uh, in English. And I'm interested when we get to the Q&A to hear uh, your opinions on that. Um, and we'll, we're gonna touch on this again later, just something to point out here, that um, we hear a lot about the, the very real clashes between Yiddish and Hebrew in Europe in the early, in Eastern Europe, in the early uh, 20th century, this kind of um, late 19th, early 20th century with the, with the emergence of the Zionist movement and this kind of competition or disagreement, what should be the national language of the Jewish people. There's a very famous conference about it in Chernobyl. Um, and I've read some interesting stuff about how in America, in this kind of, and especially in New York, in this otherwise already multicultural, multilingual environment, um, the, the, the debate was a little bit less heated. Um, and this is very interesting. This journal very much argues for both languages, Yiddish and Hebrew. These are both Jewish languages. Both of them express Jewish culture, and we want to maintain that. Um, and New York is an extremely um, important center of a new developing modern Yiddish culture. Um, it's part of the story of Jewish modernity in general, the immigration of Eastern European Jews to America is part of a story of Jewish immigration to the cities out of the shtetl, the, the small rural towns that most Jews, that many Jews still lived in in Eastern Europe. Um, but we also see here the development of a very distinctly American Yiddish culture. New York was home to the very first uh, Yiddish theater district on Second Avenue, referred to as the Jewish or Yiddish Rialto. 
there were multiple theatres, multiple shows a night um, at its peak. And here you can see just a few examples on the right, um, a poster from the New York Public Library again, Der Griner Bocher, the, the green horn uh, young man. You'll see this word uh, Griner a lot in Yiddish, means a new immigrant. And you can see here, um, or perhaps ah, you can see on the left, um, it's written Madame Bessie uh, Tomaszewski's. So, and you might be able to see from the photo as well that this is a Madame playing this young man. Um, and this is one of the huge changes to Jewish life that some people were less enthusiastic about. Some were very enthusiastic and some less so, um, which we're going to talk about in a second. And on the left here are some examples of Yiddish sheet music from the Yiddish stage in New York from the JTS collections, including some very American uh, pieces, the Jewish Yankee Doodle, um, famous Molly Pekan, the, the heroine of the Yiddish screen, um, of which New York was also a very important center, and the Little Millionaire, which uh, brings us to a very important topic uh, as well of the change that Jewish immigrants experienced in New York City. Um, New York City was for most, for a very small minority, a place where you struck it rich. And for the vast majority, uh, a place where you got even poorer. And we're gonna come to that. This is a picture from 19, 33 production of the Wise Men of Helm at the Jewish Arts Theater on Second Avenue. Um, and as you can see, this is there, they're recreating the, the shtetl um, on the stage with this beautiful scenery. Um, and this is just one example of, as I said, the many, many uh, shows that you could see in the Yiddish Theater District of New York. This theater is particularly interesting for me as I recently worked out. Um, this, this theater was used at the time in the 1930s by the Jewish um, People's Fraternal Order, a communist fraternal society. And I recently worked out that this theater was the, the location used by the Communist Party to gather uh, the first American volunteers who were sent to fight in the Spanish Civil War in 1936. This was a very exciting discovery for me, but it also shows, again, um, the important role played by Jewish communists on the communist left, which I will talk about a bit more. Um, so here you can see just a picture of the very first uh, case in the exhibition. And coming to this theme of change, of this huge change that Jews experience, that Yiddish speaking Jewish immigrants experience in New York, we're going to look at these uh, postcards, which you can see, which were blown up for the exhibition, which really um, demonstrate the biggest, the biggest changes. Um, I'll just read them to you. So this one, on the bottom, it says, in Vilna is Erge Vezen Arov. In Vilna, he was a rabbi. In New York, is Er a peddler. And in New York, he is a peddler. Um, this kind of depicts both the major changes I want to talk about. One of them is to Jewish religious life, uh, traditional Jewish religious life, which was being eroded by modern change in general, but very rapidly with the move to America and also the extreme poverty uh, many Jews experience in America and in New York. Here's another similar postcard in Der Heim, this means in, in Der ho in, at home in the, in the old country, is Ergevesen a Schuster, he was a cobbler. In New York, Paskant Er Schuyler's, and in New York, he's become an expert in halachic questions. He's basically acting as a rabbi. Um, and this is really making fun of the fact that the Jew Jewish orthodoxy had declined so 
rapidly in New York that any new immigrant from the shtetl was the biggest expert in, in halacha, in Jewish law. You know, the, the difference between the shtetl of Eastern Europe, where everybody went to Cheder, everyone learned the basics um, of, of Jewish law, and New York, where this is no longer the case at all, um, are really kind of being made fun of in this postcard. Here's another one. In that heim is er gewesen about Fila. At, at home in the old country, he was a prayer leader, someone with a beautiful voice, and like a chazan. In America, is er an italianischer tenor. And in America, he's an Italian tenor. So not only, you know, he's made, he's obviously very successful. This guy on the left, we can see he's doing very well, but he's he's not even Jewish anymore. He's, you know, um, he, he seems to be an Italian tenor. And this one, this is the, the classic story or one of the classic stories of Jewish modernity. This really, I grew up in London and the UK, but this really spoke to me as well. Um, a gans yor is er a bartender in a salon in Coney Island. All year long, he's a bartender in a salon, a saloon, in uh, Coney Island. In fact, yeah, that needs to be saloon, not salon. Af, uh, un af Rosh Hashanah v'yom Kippur vert er a chazen in a shul. And on Rosh Hashanah on Yom Kippur, he becomes a chazen in a shul. It's a cantor. He leads the seven. You can see he even grows his beard back for the for the Yontoivim. Um, and this was, you know, very much my experience growing up in a reform community in London. You know, these were the day everyone went to shul. The rest of the year, like you, you know, you couldn't fill it. <laughs> and then Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you've got to rent a tent. You know, these are the the important days of the year. Um, and again, this is kind of making fun of this. Um, and, you know, this is a subject of lots and lots of, of Jewish and Yiddish jokes in America. Um, but it was also for some people, this was a source of great concern uh, for the founders of JTS. This was a source of great concern, the, the decline of um, traditional Jewish religious life. And for many, this also represented the decline of traditional morality. So here's... Um, a poem, in fact, this, this was a song, and I know that it was a song rather than a poem because in the document, uh, in the JTS archives, it names the person who sung it. So this seems to be from a concert. Um, and we don't have any other information other than that. Uh, it, this is just a page that looks like it was ripped out of a, um, of a program from a concert. Um, and it's dated probably to the late 19th century. Um, and the song goes, and this is my translation that I did just quickly for today. The whole world is only full of swindle. Everybody strives towards one goal, old and young. They look forward to robbing and making money. They don't want to work. They work when nobody sees suggests that they're, they're doing work that isn't entirely above board or work that would be, you know, considered kosher, let's say. One hears them say they complain about America, but such a thing is unheard of because America is a golden country. You just have to be clever. You mustn't shy away from any kind of disgrace. Then you'll make enough money. The word for disgrace, which Maybe many of you know, Shand, Kashande. Uh, you know, America is the land of Shande. You, you'll do anything to make a buck. And this is, this is the religion of America. Um, anything to make it rich. And here in this line, America is a golden country, which is also the, the title of this song. America is a golden land. The America is often referred to in Yiddish as the golden Medina, the golden country. Um, but you also see this uh, subverted a lot in uh, Yiddish texts written in America that grapple with the disappointment of the American ideal.
Here we see in another uh, Yiddish publication, another political leftist publication. This one wasn't associated with any particular party, um, but it's just, it kind of makes fun of everybody, but definitely ideologically on the left. Um, it's a little bit hard to see here, but this is one of the front covers of this, uh, this magazine, Der Groiser Kundes, the big prankster. Um, and here, the headline of this cartoon is Freiheit, Gleichheit, Brüderlichkeit, freedom, uh, equality, and brotherliness, fraternity. Um, but it's illustrated this with pictures of things that are going on in the in in America right now. Um, so under Freiheit, uh, we have a picture of this guy. Yosef Katz, who is um, a union organizer with the Industrial Workers of the World, one of the biggest uh, unions in America at the time. And he's been put in jail for interfering uh, on a picket line. So he, here they've, they've written next to his uh, head here, they've written, he's been put in jail for talking to scabs. This means he's, he's obstructed people trying to go to work. Um, and under Gleichheit, uh, equality, we have a picture of um, Rockefeller, which doesn't need much explanation. And Brüderlichkeit, a picture of Theodore Roosevelt, and I think it's William Taft. Um, sorry, my American presidential history. <laughs> but in, engaged in a furious battle. So these are two politicians who had once been from the same party and are now engaged in a horrible, nasty election campaign against each other. And so this is really satirizing the ideals of the, of the, Repu the Republican ideals um, on which America was founded and questioning, um, does America live up to this? And this is something which, you know, Jews in America are doing before they're even speaking English. They're questioning this, like how can America be better? Um, and here's another one um, we didn't use in the in the exhibition. Um, another front page here. Um, this is on Lincoln Day, on Abraham Lincoln's birthday. The front cover shows a picture of Abraham Lincoln, who has freed a black slave, but is condemning, condemning uh, um, the worker here to lon sklaferai, to wage slavery. Um, and he's being beaten here with, with the, the whip of hunger and loneliness and other ways in which the working class, which most Jewish immigrants were part of, uh, suffered in America. And for this next one, I'm going to play you a little clip. So this is another um, piece of sheet music that features in the exhibition. There's a very famous song. I actually sung this uh, with a, a Yiddish uh, klezmer band that played the opening of the exhibition at JTS. It's called Die Grine Cousine. I'm sure that of the many of you who've joined today, lots of you will know this already. This is a song um, and it kind of epitomizes so much of what America was for Yiddish speaking immigrants. Um, because on the one hand, this, this is an example of Yiddish popular music, you know, of a song that became really popular on the Yiddish stage. Um, but on the other hand, it tells a very sad story to a very jaunty tune. Um, but it tells a very sad story of uh, someone whose cousin comes over from, from Eastern Europe, from the old country. And when she arrives in America, she's so excited. She's as beautiful as gold. She has rosy cheeks. She doesn't speak. She sings. She doesn't walk. She jumps. Um, and, you know, she's just excited to be in America. He manages to get her a job in a millinery store, which I found out um, from Eve Sicular, uh, a, a klezmer, a musician and a, a great researcher of the Yiddish screen and stage actually was a kind of code for prostitution. Um, so he gets her this job 
And lo and behold, after just a few years, she's lost the rosiness in her cheeks. Um, she has black bags under her eyes. There's almost nothing left of her. And whereas in the middle of the song, the singer says, Lebensal Columbus is Medina. The, may, may, the, may America, may Columbus's country live, you know, many years, long live America. It ends, ends with Brennensal Columbus is Medina. May it burn, usually gets translated in English as it can go to hell. Um, but I'm going to play you just a little clip. This is of uh, Theodore Bikel uh, singing. Som i rizge kome na kuzene, shein vi goldi zige venti grine, bekalach vi roite pomeransen, fisa lach vos beten zich zum tansen, bekalach vi roite pomeransen, fisa lach vos beten zich zum tansen. Herra lach vi zaiden web gelogde. Sein da lach wie pera lach getokte, eiga lach wie himmel bloi in Frühling, lipa lach wie karsha lach an Zwilling, eiga lach wie himmel bloi in Frühling, lipa lach wie karsha lach an Zwilling. Okay, um, and I think this is a good moment to pause for questions. I just wanted to let you hear a little bit of the sound of, of Yiddish New York and this, this, um, I can only think of the Yiddish word in my head, the contradiction <laughs> between, uh, between the, 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 this great tune, you know, this, you can feel like you know, the vibe <laughs> of the Yiddish theater district, um, and the huge sadness of the story that it told, it tells, um, I'll just stop screen sharing briefly so I can answer questions. Um, thank you. Lots of interesting questions have come in and they're they're popping in at the moment faster than I can catch them. Um, so um, well why don't why don't we start with kind of where you just ended. Um, someone mentioned the movie, uh, the American, um, an American tale, the animated movie, which, which I confess I was thinking about also, um, cause I just, I watched it a little while ago with my son. Um, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen it, there's this great song. There are no cats in America. The, the, the characters are mice. There are no cats in America and the streets are paved with cheese. Um, so, you know, obviously there were cats in America and the streets weren't paved with cheese. So, um, the question from, from another, um, participant was um is are they just kind of you know reckoning with the reality um of you know how hard it is to be to be a poor immigrant or do you think that there was um was there kind of real buyer's remorse and sort of romanticization or serious consideration of like maybe actually we shouldn't have come over um so that's the question and um, I think that depends on the individuals, but but certainly there, and I'm we're going to get onto that now actually. So it's a good question. Um, is that they're definitely reckoning with just some terrible conditions that they face here. You know, that is that is the story of um the working class in the late 19th, early 20th century. This isn't only a Jewish story, but it is a Jewish story um also here in New York and one that was often told in Yiddish. Um, yeah, they are, they are struggling with some very real things. As for remorse, people have different attitudes and some people did move back. Uh, more people kept coming as, as well. So you, you see both in the, in the archival material, both attitudes? Yes, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, there was a question about the postcards. I've, I found those, my question about the postcards is I'm, I'm trying to imagine the context in which someone would send it, but um, <laughs> this, so I'll just read what this person wrote. Um, I was recently told that the rabbi of my childhood Orthodox synagogue in the 50s was never a rabbi in Europe and didn't have smicha. 
it leads to a different interpretation of the shoemaker who became a POSIC, not just that Jewish education declined in the US, but that anyone could lie about who they were in Europe. So it's, um, there's sort of, you know, uh, um, this kind of uh, lamenting our watered down Jewish um, culture and authority, but also maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very unflattering portrayal of like our fellow Jews in certain contexts and sort of them like taking advantage of the situation. I don't know if you see that there as well. Sure. And I think, you know, most, I've not studied every publication on display or that I'm talking about in enough detail to really be able to talk about every editor and writer and, you know, their motivations. But um, generally in kind of modern Yiddish publications, I would say most most of them have a um a critical view to sorry when i talk about mo i'm talking about a specific genre which are the ones that i'm showing you of course there were modern uh traditional and religious publications as well but these leftist publications usually have a critical eye on jewish tradition as well you know for some uh the immigration to america also offered the opportunity for a new approach to Jewish religion and education. You know, this was the case um, from what I know of the, the founders of JTS and of many of the, you know, rabbinical seminaries and centers of Jewish education in New York. So certainly they are also, they are also criticizing this, um, this assessment of Jewish learning that is, you know, you can name all of that, you know, you can recite enough passages of Talmud or you can you know you know all the details of this very specific halakha and that's what gives you the legitimacy to act as a rabbi um it's not you know your ability to interact with human beings or to lead services or kind of different criteria that have actually ended up becoming the way that we tend to assess rabbis today um, so I'll ask you one more question, and then before you go on, I just wanted to make a quick comment in response to some things that have come in. But the question is, um, how how limited is all of this to New York? Is is um, I mean, obviously this was the center of act of the kind of activity you're talking about. Um, you know, was there a broader um, you know consumer base of the newspapers? Was the, the Yiddish culture sort of trickling out to other places, or was was this really a New York phenomenon? Oh, no, absolutely. This was a transnational phenomenon. And also, you know, New York was very closely connected with other major cities and centers of Jewish immigration in the US as well. But I'm actually going to show you an example of a Yiddish newspaper that that was sent from New York to Europe and um, and then came back to JTS from Europe. Um, yeah, this was very much a transnational phenomenon and actually when it comes to the Jewish left, the Jewish labor movement, which um, I'm gonna go move on to in a moment, um, New York was a very important foundational center for the whole of the Jewish left, also in Europe. The assumption tends to be, you know, revolutionaries came over from Russia, but actually in the late 19th century, when the Jewish labor movement um, developed in, in the US and particularly in New York, it's still just embryonic in Eastern Europe. It was very, very difficult for the left to organize in Russia, in Tsarist Russia. And in America, they had freedoms that they didn't have in the old country. And actually, they could then bring back publications, ideas, people to Europe. Um, so no, this is very much, you know, there are certain things that are very New York, but this is very much a transnational culture. That's that's very interesting. Um, okay, the, just the quick comment I wanted to make was there were a few um, a few things coming in in the chat about representation and non Ashkenazi Jews. So I just wanted to um, I just wanted to say that no one should um, assume by our having this session that we're you know we're taking um, that we're taking for granted an affirmative um, orientation to Jewish history or culture or um, or text. So we've done, you know, many, many sessions on, um, we've done a session on uh, Mizrahi uh, Israeli literature, 
of new immigrants in the early years of the statehood and all kinds of sessions on non-Ashkenazi Jews in pre-modern times. So I just wanted to set that record straight in, record straight in case anyone since there are concerns about that, this particular session is on, you know, this, this particular culture culture and this group of Jews, but um, but not uh, not to um, not at the exclusion of our interest in other groups of Jews. Uh, so let's why don't we go back to your material? Great, thank you. And yes, um, I mean, there, like, I'm going to talk a little bit about the the efforts to preserve Yiddish language and Yiddish culture, um, and actually, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my own research on Jewish communists and the radical Jewish left who often get criticized for um, not having a kind of, again, I'm going to use the word kosher, but I'm obviously using it slightly sarcastically, approach to Jewish culture, that they're too internationalist, they're not focused enough. But I would say that actually, um, there are problems with other forms of Yiddishism, um, Yiddishism being the kind of political movement to maintain, political and cultural movement to maintain and teach and, you know, disseminate Yiddish culture, which I'm very much part of as, you know, myself, a Yiddish teacher and someone who's very dedicated to this particular um, Jewish culture that is my own ancestry. Um, but there is a problem with, with uh, an approach that's too focused on Yiddish Jewish culture, which is that it discludes, um, it discludes collaboration um, with non-Jews and with Jews uh, from other backgrounds and with other languages. Um, so it's an interesting point to have raised. Uh, an important point to address. Um, okay. So um, as I said, in response to one of those questions, um, Jews in these kind of these songs um, describing the disappointment with America, uh, Jews are also referring to very real, um, sometimes horrific situations that um, working class immigrants in New York as working class immigrants elsewhere in the world experience. Um, on the left here, you see the, the sheet music for that song, Die Grine Cousine, that we heard. Um, and on the right, um, you see another, another song, Mama New, uh, Mother Dearest, um, which uh, was written as an elegy to the victims of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which again, I'm sure some of you have heard of. Um, in 1911, this horrific fire that broke out um, in a uh, in a factory, a sweatshop on Washington Place. Um, hundreds, I think, a hundred, and we're going to see the number in a second in the Yiddish newspaper. Almost 150 dead. This was a sweatshop that made um, literally, you know, waistbands for women's clothing. Um, it employed mostly female uh, workers, and the majority of them were Jewish uh, or Italian, also a number of Italian immigrants. And this also included young girls. Um, you know, I think the youngest victim was maybe even eight or nine years old. Um, a fire broke out in the factory, and this was, there was a very common practice at the time of locking workers in uh, so that they couldn't take breaks. Um, you know, they worked for many, many hours, even without incidents like this. These are extremely unsanitary conditions. Um, the building didn't have proper fire escapes. Um, I think there was only one or two elevators. One of the elevators was broken in the fire. Um, you can certainly, there's a huge amount of information and really great accessible exhibitions um, about this, about this uh, incident also online. Um, but this was a tragedy for the Jewish, for the Yiddish immigrant uh, community. Here you can see the, the front page of the Vorwärts, and it reads, Der Morg is full mit unsere Korbones. The Morg is full of our victims. Der ganzer Yiddischer Quartal is in Troyer. Um, the whole of the, the Yiddish quarter the Yiddish area of New York is in mourning. And here you have a list of the dead that they've started to compile. Um, and here, you know, the next day pictures start to come out. This was really a very 
a personal incident um, as well. Like many people, you know, lost families or friends. This is a period where people lived in very close quarters as well and also suffered accidents and health problems because of their living conditions as well as their working conditions. Um, and this, it, this caused an extreme outcry, um, a cultural outpouring. This is another poem written by Morris Rosenfeld, another very important Yiddish New York figure, the kind of most famous of the poets known as the sweatshop poets, sweatshop poets. Um, and these are some of the lyrics to one of his most famous poems that's subsequently been set to music. My Nurua Platz, my rest, my resting place. Um, you know, my resting place is in the factory. I don't, I don't get to go home and have a rest. Um, I am here where lives wither at machines. Um, I'm a slave uh in you know, basically in he's talking about the chains of the machines, but he's using chains metaphorically here as well to talk to this, this idea of wage slavery um, that is used a lot in kind of working class and Yiddish working class culture at the time. Um, and this incident also um, created a huge political outrage um, and Jewish socialists in particular, by this time, by 1911, there's already um, a very impressive Jewish socialist movement in New York. Jewish socialists were involved in um, forming some of the, the biggest uh, trade unions in America. They were um, also involved in the fight for better working conditions and for some basic laws. You know, it was after the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire um, that some laws about, you know, fire safety in workplaces, for example, came in and Jewish socialists um, played a very important part in achieving that. Um, but first, I just want to step back a little bit um, to some very interesting documents that are held in the JTS archives that you can see here. Um, there's a collection of, I think, about 40 of these small constitutions that were written by um, Yiddish immigrant associations which were created very quickly they come you know they they all date so i think some of the oldest ones are sort of 1870s and then there are also examples from the 1920s um so actually in eastern europe in the shtetlach of eastern europe which is a very formative place for ashkenazi jewish culture there was already a system of kind of what we might describe as mutual aid um called chevres kind of societies, charitable associations that people would be members of, um, and they would come together to form particular functions. A lot of synagogues and communities today will still have a Hevra Kadisha, uh, the Holy Society, which is um, in charge of burial. Um, so this was also the most uh, respected and important um, society in a in any shtetl but other ones as well that organized um help for the sick uh help for uh impoverished young people who were going to get married you know there would often be a society for orphaned brides who didn't have parents to them with a dowry um and things like this and these these organizations often formed a kind of proto insurance you know you you joined the organization you paid membership and then when you were in need, you could take out of that, um, of that kind of kitty. And immigrants in New York very quickly formed similar associations. Most of them um, are what, what uh, is known as Landsmannschaften, so just simply associations of people who came to America from the same place in Europe, from the same town. Um, so here, for example, on the far left, you can see Constitution und uh, Hoster Society. So that's the, the Society of People from Hosht, um, which I believe is now in Ukraine. The borders changed very often in Eastern Europe. Um, and above, there's a constitution of the, the progressive young people of Tangansha, another, another Eastern European shtetl. So people would form these associations and they 
one of the first goals usually would be um, a burial society, you know, something to ensure that you could have a Jewish burial. And in New York, they had to um, reckon with American law, you know, you had to buy a burial plot and make sure that it was, um, you know, made uh, kosher, made um, appropriate for a Jewish burial. Um, and these societies formed to do that. But often they also offered something like health insurance. Um, they provided a connection with the old country. You know, someone else wanted to come over to America from this town or this uh, this city, this shtetl, this region. Uh, the the landsmanschaft would maybe help with that. And they also just provided a very important communal connection. You know, a sense of community in a place where, you know especially if you've moved directly to New York from the shtetl, that's a huge change. You know, that's very big. You're moving, um, and as someone who has myself moved to New York um, from a shtetl, actually, although one in France, but I come from London, so it wasn't such a big change for me. But New York, New York's a big place. Um, and if you're moving from a shtetl where everybody knows each other to this huge city, um, this is a big change. And these associations were very important. And very quickly, uh, we start to see um, more political associations. So Eastern European Jews, I'm sure most of you know, uh, living in New York in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, mostly lived on the Lower East Side. And the Lower East Side was already home to a big German immigrant population who were very, um, many of whom were very involved in the socialist movement. And this was a huge influence. Um, brought to Jews often through particular intellectuals like Abe Kahan, the founder of the Forverts, like uh, Alexander Harkavi, who we're going to uh, look at in a moment. Um, so Jews are very quickly attracted and recruited to the socialist movement. And at the same time, these existing associations, these landsmanschaften, we see people start to form um, associations that are more overtly political in nature. So if you look on the bottom left there, the constitution of the United Cooperative Workers Society, um, this is from 1923 in New York, and this society was specifically founded to build um, cooperative housing, a project which it in the Bronx, um, which I, I'm, maybe some of you are familiar with the, the Bronx co-ops, a very important part of New York Jewish history. Um, and this project uh, to build cooperative housing was later taken over by some much bigger organizations, um, including those on the right. So on the right, you can see the 25th um, almanac of the Workman's Circle. Um, the Workman's Circle, now known as the Workers' Circle, still exists. Um, was actually founded in 1897 as the Working Men's Circle Society of New York. So it began as a New York organization and it was founded um, basically to act like a landsmanschaft, to be this communal kind of insurance organization that would provide people with, with burial, with uh, a form of health insurance, with, uh, you know, with help when they were in need. But rather than be an organization for people who are from the same place, this was going to be an organization of people who shared the same progressive ideals. And they weren't just going to help people out when they were in need. They were also going to protest and organize against um, the kind of situations that left working class immigrants in need. So they're going to you know, fight for better working conditions. and members of the workers circle are very involved in the protest movement that happens after the the triangle fire they're very involved in the socialist party the workers circle is very connected to the socialist party um and by 19 uh i think in 1900 it became a national organization with branches all over the country by 1925, um, it had a huge infrastructure, libraries, supplementary schools um, that taught children this kind of um, new progressive socialist vision of Jewish culture um, and very quickly became an important uh, teacher of the Yiddish language as well to children. 
It had a sanatorium uh, for people suffering from tuberculosis. Um, it had summer camps. I'm actually going to go and work next week on the workers' circle trip to Yiddish land, which still takes place every year in the summer camp that um, you know was founded. Uh, well, the original one was founded in, in I think, 1923. Um, it had uh, choirs and a theatre troupe and all kinds of cultural uh, organisations, and it provided people with, you know, very much needed help um, in their daily lives, schools for workers, evening schools for workers. Um, and... In 1930, 1931, uh, there's a very important split in the workers' circle. By this time, um, the Bol Bolshevik Revolution has taken place. The Communist Party of America is founded. And there is a big group of, um, of workers' circle activists who want to affiliate with the Communist Party. And there's a huge dispute over this. And this eventually leads to a split and leads to the founding of the International uh, Workers' Order, um, which you can see uh, their constitution on the bottom right there, um, just underneath that of the Workers' Circle. The International Workers' Order was founded originally as a Jewish fraternal society, like the Workers' Circle, and it quickly affiliated with other fraternal societies. So this, this, um, this, method of forming fraternal organizations for people from the same place um, or for people with kind of shared needs who share a language and a culture um, and workers who you know need help with things like accessing healthcare in New York City this was not just a Jewish phenomenon um, so there's also Slavic societies Italian societies you know societies for all kinds of immigrants and the international workers order is very interesting um, because they they affiliated with other societies of other immigrants to become this kind of big international organization. Um, and these are the the activists that I have mostly studied as these um, Jewish communists who uh, are so very uh, controversial and interesting um, to study. And here are just a couple of pictures of that, of these constitutions up close. You can see there, well, maybe you can't see from this picture, actually, that's blown up. They're kind of pocketbook sized, you know, they're designed for people to carry around with them. Um, some of them are very uh, makeshift. There was one in the JTS collections that looks like it's made out of wallpaper, which is very interesting. Um, and, you know, this this would be a fascinating study to look at all of these documents in the JTS archives. Um, in detail would be very interesting, I think. Here's a picture of the Workers' Circle Almanac, and here the constitution of the International Workers' Order, and that of the um, Cooperative Workers' Society that uh, built the started the project of building the co-ops in the Bronx. Um, as I said before, Jews involved in the labor movement, Jews quickly become involved in political parties, particularly the Socialist Party and then later the Communist Party. They're also extremely involved in trade unions. In fact, Yiddish speaking Jews helped to found some of the biggest um, and most important trade unions in America. Um, an example of one of those unions is the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, um, which is a very well known trade union. And this paper on the left, um, it took me a little bit of time to figure out what it is but it appears to be um, the publication of one specific branch of that union. And if you look at the Cornell University archives where the union archives are held, you can see that right up until the forties when this newspaper was written, many branches of the union are still conducting their business in Yiddish or in other languages. Um, Yiddish seems to be the kind of the majority, but there are also Italian speaking branches and Spanish speaking branches like this, you know, the working class in New York is mostly an immigrant um, working class. And that is reflected in, in the publications of these trade unions. Um, this is kind of a weird document. Um, it seems to have been written by one guy who is very angry with the other members of his union, 
and he has the ability to create a newspaper. So he's done that. Um, and my dream is that someone's going to walk into the JTS exhibition while it's still up and say, oh, that was my grandfather. And we'll be able to find out more about this very interesting and angry man. It doesn't tell us much else about the union. Um, the newspaper on the right, far more graphic, is the newspaper of the, um, of the needle trades uh, union, the needle trades workers union. It's from 1932. This is a communist publication, and this is a time when communists are really trying to break into uh, the trade unions um, in America. And uh, you can see here uh, a very typical, <laughs> very uh, radical, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of violent image um, of a worker who has nailed his forbos, his foreman, to the table. And underneath the foreman uh, is a picture, is a, a, a guy who's labeled AFL, the American Federation of Labor, which was considered a liberal, you know, not radical enough uh, bourgeois uh, attempt at organizing workers. And this is saying we should follow the, the militant example of the Communist Party. Um, and I'll just share with you that when I, I took a, a school group uh, or a synagogue a Heide group around the exhibition of, of kids and I asked them what they thought this picture was and they said they thought it was a tattoo artist union, which I thought was just a very sweet and very good guess, to be fair, if you don't read Yiddish. Um, and this paper, this is maybe for me the most interesting find in the archive. This is an anarchist newspaper, um, Die Freiheit. Now, there's a very famous uh, communist newspaper, the Morgen Freiheit, which began as the Freiheit and was published in New York in the 1920s. And I also know of another anarchist newspaper um, in, in New York that was published in 1918 before um, the publishers were actually taken to court. Uh, this is from 1930, and I've not been able to find anything uh, on a Yiddish anarchist newspaper by this name in 1913. Um, so I've been reaching out to some other researchers uh, who are experts in the anarchist movement. I hope I'm going to discover more about it. Um, but it just shows you the extent of Jewish leftist organizing in New York City that even though we actually you know there are there are lists of anarchist Yiddish publications, communist Yiddish publications, socialist Yiddish publications, and we're still finding new ones. Um, and this newspaper is also very interesting. It was published in 1913, and it was then sent back to Europe. And this newspaper came back to JTS with um, a collection of materials that were rescued after the Holocaust. So um, this kind of, in just this one item, tells you so much about Yiddish New York. Um, it illustrates the importance of New York as a center of Yiddish political organizing. You know, anarchists in 1913 in Russia could not openly publish a newspaper. In New York, they could, and they could send it back, and that way agitate at home as well. Um, and uh, this also illustrates the importance of New York after the Holocaust, after so many centers of Eastern European Yiddish culture were destroyed. Um, are there any questions at this point before I move on to my final little? Um, there are there are a couple. I'm I'm also watching the time. Um, maybe I'll yeah. just um, maybe I'll just share one. But I also can. <laughs> I just can't resist. Um, someone shared an anecdote that her her grandmother um, was a reader of the forward and like sent I guess sent her to buy the paper. She her job was to bring it home and she accidentally brought home the Freiheit and oh, wow. her, sent her back <laughs> to return it and get her dime back. Um, so it's just a nice it illustrates exactly what you were talking about. Um, yes. Questions about communists and socialists that you that you've talked about. Um, you can tell me if you want to address this now or if it's or or um or move ahead but there was a question about how how or if um these papers addressed um nazi persecution in europe during the second world war um 
yeah, they, I mean, they certainly did. Um, you know, one of the, um, one of the, the problems that I work with studying Jewish communists, and I, I study, I've done a lot of work on the Spanish Civil War when, you know, um, volunteers and actually a huge number of Yiddish speaking Jewish volunteers went to fight uh, Hitler and Mussolini and Franco in Spain. Um, that, you know, the Jewish left were some of the first to actually fight back and to warn the world about the dangers of fascism. Um, what's tricky um, to understand about it and very difficult for us, it's extremely difficult for us to look back on this period and imagine um, a world where Hitler has come to power, but we can't yet imagine the Holocaust taking place. And that was the reality, you know, that that uh, for as a historian, as a researcher, I have to bear in mind when I'm looking at this stuff um, that that they were they did not have the hindsight that I now have, and that's something that's that uh, I have to grapple with. But so so it's a long way of saying they certainly did, um, but they're writing with a very different perspective. Um, there, one thing that I found in the JTS archives that I was really sad in the end to not include in the exhibition because it was so fascinating, but basically just too weird. And you know, <laughs> there's a limited amount of space and you want to tell a story, um, but I hope that it'll be used in the future. I found two um, articles, poems. One of them was really more like an incantation written by a shadchan, a matchmaker, a New York matchmaker in Yiddish, anti-Hitler poems. But one of them, like it really reads like he's trying to cast a spell. And these are just fascinating. He gives his address. Um, but yeah, it's very hard to know what to do with them without doing a lot more further research and trying to find out where they came from. But yes, certainly they did address this. Thank you. Why don't you go ahead with whatever uh, more you can say? Great. Let's <laughs> yeah. Let's just finish up because I I'm obviously I always you know this is my my great challenge is trying to keep things to time. There's always so many things I want to share, but I just I want to briefly touch on since um since the topic of these talks are change. You know we've talked about um the 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 different living conditions that Jewish immigrants experience. You know living in a big city. Many Jews were impoverished in Eastern Europe, but they come, it's a very different kind of poverty. The experience of the sweatshop and of the tenement, this is a different um, experience. And it is one that Jews reacted to, or that many Jews, particularly on the left, reacted to very strongly. And we've talked about the decline of the Jewish tradition, a religious tradition. But another story, obviously, is of the story of the changes to Yiddish. Um, firstly, we see in America, uh, Yiddish adopts lots of American words, English words, um, but also just children who are born in the US tend to speak American or English. <laughs> I, I'll call it American, um, tend to speak English. And there are lots of stories, um, you know, stories of Jewish immigrants in America where the parent will speak to the child in Yiddish and the child will respond in English. And um, I'm not going to be able to cover this whole story, but just for my particular niche of the Jewish left, this is kind of a problem um, because on the one hand, Jewish leftists, Jewish socialists and communists are ideologically anti-nationalist. So they're not really supposed to care about Yiddish and about, you know, Jewish national culture, um, but, but they do. Um, and on the other hand, uh, actually many of them, and this is true of Jewish communists, and this is something I'm looking into more carefully because it's very interesting, um, adopt a kind of anti-assimilationist perspective on the basis that, you know, um, it's more anti-capitalist, it's more anti-bourgeois, it's more anti the system to speak a minority language. It can be an act of protest to continue to speak Yiddish in America. Um, at first, the Jewish left mostly, you know, produces newspapers and things in Yiddish because it has to. 
that's literally the language that people speak. And if it wants to organize Jews, if it wants to educate Jewish workers, help them improve their conditions, it has to speak to them in Yiddish. So actually in America and in Europe, many um, kind of intellectual Jewish activists have to either learn Yiddish or relearn Yiddish. You know, they, they've started speaking Russian or um, German or another language you know, and forgotten the Yiddish of their childhood, and they have to go back to it in order to organize the masses. And this also happens in America. Um, but the process of creating these materials in Yiddish also creates a love of Yiddish, and it helps to foster a new Yiddish culture, a Yiddish political, secular culture that many become very committed to. Um, and this so there are a few examples in the exhibition of materials produced by this man, whose name is very blurred there. This is Alexander Hakarvi, who is, um, many refer to him as the founder of Yiddish linguistics. He is um, the author of the very first Yiddish English dictionary and the first Yiddish English Hebrew dictionary. Um, something that I don't mention or that we didn't mention in the, in the exhibition is that Harkavi was actually an anarchist. Um, and he had a very interesting take on uh, language, which um, which the historian, the the literary scholar Anna Elana Torres refers to as language anarchism, which he he didn't advocate any one particular an language. He advocated for a mixture, you know, a kind of internationalist approach to language. And this was the reality of most Yiddish speakers. Most Yiddish speakers were. Um, or most Yiddish speaking intellectuals, let's say, were, were bilingual, at least, if not trilingual or more than that. Um, but Harkavi also produced just a number of very interesting accessibility materials to help Yiddish speaking immigrants navigate their way around America. Here you see a list of questions um, that are asked at a citizenship interview. A lot of them are in uh, Yiddish with um, Sorry, they're in English, but written in Hebrew letters. So if you go to see the exhibition, I really encourage you, if you know the Aleph Bet, to try and read them, even if you don't speak Yiddish. And the same is true for this, his uh, very famous Brievensteller, his letter writing guide phrase book, which um, gives you the Yiddish, the English in Yiddish letters, um, and the English in Latin letters as well. Um, to help people navigate their way around um, America. Um, and then organizations like the Worker's Circle, this is just one example of a Worker's Circle publication on hygiene, also produce these very useful materials in Yiddish to help um, to, to educate Jewish workers. Um, but as I said, the process of creating these Yiddish materials um, Whereas Harkavi is an example of someone who was already very dedicated to the Yiddish language, just not in a national sense. You know, he didn't argue that this should be the language of the Jews, but he definitely wanted to see the survival of Yiddish language and Yiddish culture. Um, but through the process of um, creating these cultural materials, actually, uh, many on the Jewish left did become advocates for Yiddish culture and the Yiddish language, which they justified in various ways. Um, and uh, here's an example of uh, materials that were written for uh, Yiddish children's camps, summer camps, um, the Ballad of a Kindercamp, the Ballad of a, of a Children's Summer Camp. Here's a picture of what was originally the workers' circle uh, summer camp in Hopewell Junction, which is where I'll be next week, um, doing garden work. Uh, this camp was subsequently taken over by the International Workers' Order. And something that I'm very interested in in my own research is uh, the fact that Yiddish communists were often the most um, dogmatic about the Yiddish language, whereas Yiddish socialists and the, the Forwärts had a much more pragmatic approach. You know, we just need to speak Yiddish so that people understand us. Communists actually 
were often much more forceful. And in the Morgen Freiheit, the Yiddish communist newspaper, you know, alongside uh, ideological, you know, manifestos, you also get manifestos about the Yiddish language. Um, I read a very funny one against taking on English terms in Yiddish, um, like against nemenishin, saying like, take a shower or take a walk. They wrote, this is not good Yiddish. And it, it's very interesting to me that this was a position, you know, that communists were arguing for good Yiddish. But it also, in some ways, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Here's an example of some materials from the communist summer camp camp Kinderland. This is Mitzi, Mitzi mit die Zepp, Mitzi with the plaits, the, the braids is running for mayor. Um, the, they're teaching ch Jewish children this kind of secular Jewish leftist identity, but they're also teaching them Yiddish language. And here's an example of a... Um, something written in Yiddish by a camper, uh, Arlen Damsky, uh, about the need for peace in the world. Here he writes also about the need for peace in Israel, Palestine. Um, and I just want to end actually with kind of these thoughts about the efforts to preserve Yiddish language and these reactions to assimilation but also something that I've observed in my research on the Jewish left, which is um, this articulation of a Jewish identity based in uh, leftist principles. This idea that being a Jew means to always stand with the oppressed. Um, and this is something that I've come across in my studies of uh, the Yiddish speaking left in New York. Uh, here's an example of a, a form filled out by a Jewish Yiddish speaking volunteer in the international international brigades in the Spanish Civil War. And I just find it so interesting that for nationality, he wrote American Jew. So he's a communist um, and he wants to move to the Soviet Union, but he also sees himself as an American Jew. And he has this vision, if you read his forms, of what that means um, of being an American Jew, meaning being somebody who stands with the oppressed and who has this mixed identity uh, that isn't, you know, just American or just Jewish or just communist in this case. Um, and I'm going to end with that thought. This is from this uh, publication, Der Hammer. I apologize for how blurry it is. It's something I snapped quickly in an archive. This is um, a Yiddish translation of the poem by Langston Hughes, uh, the very famous black activist of uh, the period of the interwar period and after the Second World War um, called, I, I can't actually remember the English title, so I'm just translating from the Yiddish here. I'm doing a meta translation. Let America be America again. And this vision, of this America of equal opportunity, of multiculturalism, the vision that we started with, where Jews are free to be human beings, but also to be Jews and have, for Jewish leftists, not so much the Jewish religion, but a Jewish culture that is original and to some extent autonomous. Um, and this is, this is the vision that we see in the Yiddish speaking Jewish left. And that comes across a little bit in this exhibition. And I can see that it's already uh, 2.31 <laughs> there. So I'm going to stop talking. Um, Annie, I want to thank you so much. This was, you know, you, you checked so many boxes in terms of the theme of change. Um, you know, this, this um, I was going to say community, but large set of multiple communities driving political change in Europe, uh, driving labor movement change in America. Um, shepherding its own members, becoming becoming Americans. Um, so this was fascinating, and I also I, well, I wanted to add. You know, so many people have been sharing in the chat um, questions and stories related to their family history, and I, you know, same. I'm, I'm also um, all kinds of things uh, in my family as well. Um, and so I want to thank you on that level too, because for for the many people here who, who this does connect to their family history. 
Um, this was much more nuanced than this contextualized a lot of things for me, um, for my family, um, my family lore, and I, I'm, I'm guessing it's the same for others too. So thank you on, on both levels for a really beautiful presentation. I want to, I'm going to put in the chat, um, Um, I just muted. I'm going to put in the chat a link to a couple of um, YouTube videos about the uh, exhibit for those who aren't in New York. For those who are in New York, we would love for you to come see it. The exhibit's open until October 5th. Um, and I've also put a link in there um, about our uh, about our fall um, our fall uh, our next web webinar series in September. Um, and finally, I wanted to again thank. Uh, Audrey and Yale Aspel for sponsoring this wonderful session today in memory of uh, of Audrey's grandparents. I hope that I'm not sure how much I muted myself for. Hopefully, um, hopefully my comments at the end made it through. Okay, it looks like they did from the chat. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us. We hope you'll come back for the last session in the series a week from today. Um, on um, on community organizing uh, in the American Jewish community and that that aspect of change and thank you so much again Annabelle Cohen for um, for curating an amazing exhibit and sharing sharing this really rich material with us in in, in such a um, such a really substantive and nuanced way it's been great. Thank you. Yeah, one of my favorite things about doing this is the stories I get to hear. Every tour I've given of the exhibit lasts way longer than it should um, if you would like to share stories with me I would love to hear them I think you can find my email um, through the JTS website um, and thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this series and everyone who's come to listen great take care everyone thank you, thank you.